The July 14, 2021 Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners meeting is now convened. Pam, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Platt. Commissioner Gambetti. Here. Commissioner Stoudemire Wesley. Commissioner Myers. Here. Chair Cruz. Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I have a brief notice to read. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing, Prosper Portland is holding this meeting electronically and allow as allowed by state law. All members of the commission are attending remotely by phone or by Zoom, and Prosper Portland has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The public can also provide written testimony to the commission by emailing prospercommissioners at prosperportland.us Again, Prosper Commissioners at prosperportland.us. Thanks very much. So uh, we'll go ahead and start off with commissioner reports. Does anyone have anything they'd like to report this month? Nope, okay. We will uh, continue on then. Uh, Executive Director Branham, would you like to go next? Good afternoon, Chair Cruz and Commissioners. It's great to see you all and uh, know that I, we will be seeing each other in person uh, in the not too distant future at a meeting. So looking forward to that. I wanted to share a couple of notable items from the last few weeks and highlight a few upcoming events before I introduce our new Economic Development Director. So just to start on Tuesday, June 29th, I was honored to join Mayor Wheeler and a group of civic leaders to speak at the dedication ceremony for the Rise Against Hate billboard in Old Town. I wanna thank Neil Lee and Raymond Chang and the rest of the members of the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association for organizing the billboard, which is on Northwest 4th and Davis, uh, which Prosper Portland co-sponsored this event offered a critical opportunity to stand alongside local community leaders and make it clear that hatred and bigotry, racism and xenophobia will not be tolerated. And the symbolism of the billboard in Old Town Chinatown, given um, its, its history was uh, really resonated for everyone. On the Prosper Portland side, I wanna acknowledge Bertie Karoski and Ann Mangan for their work to support this partnership and the event. And then on Wednesday, June 30th, I was invited to serve as a panelist on the Portland Business Alliance June video forum, uh, which was called Humanizing Your Reopening Plan. Uh, it ended up being very well-timed because it was the same day that Governor Brown announced a significant reduction in public health requirements for local businesses. I was joined on the panel by Cyrilda Summers McGee, uh, founder of CEO of Workplace Change, Pat Welch, co-founder and CEO of Bolly Welch, and Andrew Spank uh, with uh, Spack, excuse me, co-managing partner at Baron Lehman. And a key takeaway was that the hybrid environment is here to stay, um, but also that easing back is important. Um, We've all been through a lot and it's important to support uh, ourselves and others in making an easy transition. And so to that end, uh, Prosper Portland is aligning with the city and we've reopened our office uh, to staff on an invitation basis. Um, but we are doing that in a um, sort of in an invitation way and in a thoughtful way. And we look forward to welcoming partners in the not too distant future uh, and fully um, having staff there on a more regular basis later this fall. So looking forward, the city of Portland has designated the weekend of Friday, July 23rd through Sunday, tw July 25th as a celebration for reopening of the downtown core. There are a lot of activities um, among those include a sing-along performance by Pink Martini at Pioneer Courthouse Square and the opening of the new Ankeny West food cart pod, which Prosper Portland has been significantly involved in. You can also stop by the My People's Market window shop, which will have special events featuring food vendors and businesses. Um, as you well know, this event features local black, indigenous, and all people of color makers at the 10Y building. Uh, the window display faces the library, uh, which is at uh, Southwest 7th, that, that max stop. While you're there, you can swing by Oryx Leather, the Abbey Creek Winery Tasting Room and Amity Artisan Goods, 
lots going on. And for the latest information, you can go to beherefortland.com and at My People's Market on Instagram. Speaking of My People's Market, I look forward to seeing everyone at the market, which is taking place in real life on Friday, uh, August 6th through Sunday, August 8th on the North Park Blocks in downtown Portland for the seventh edition. It's featuring more than 75 different vendors each day. There will be local performers, delicious food, and you can find out a lot more at mypeoplesmarket.com and click on the MPM7 tab, My People's Market 7 tab. Huge appreciation to Amanda Park and the enormous team that is helping make this possible. In addition to downtown activities, uh, I wanna mention the Park Rose Marketplace monthly market is happening the weekend of July 24th and 25th as well. If you haven't been out, recommend that you do. It's an event aimed at giving more support and visibility to local small businesses and artists while providing an event to connect with neighbors, to shop um, with great home-based vendors and to enjoy some local food, uh, coffee, arts and crafts. You can find out more at historicparkrose.com. So finally, I want to introduce someone uh, to you in a new capacity that you already know, which is our own Shay Flaherty Bettine. He's accepted the position of Economic Development Director at Prosper Portland. Uh, in this capacity, he'll lead the team that's responsible for uh, supporting our target industry clusters, community-led economic development, business competitiveness, inclusive entrepreneurship, and international trade. Uh, we've all known him uh, in the last two years as our Entrepreneurship and Community Economic Development Manager. He was instrumental in shaping the relief and stabilization framework and overseeing the small business relief fund that delivered relief to more than 1500 vulnerable business owners, uh, while at the same time continuing to work with our uh, community partners to uh, provide business technical assistance and our neighborhood prosperity initiative efforts uh, and workforce development programs. We actually worked with Shay but prior to him joining Prosper Portland, he was part of the Inclusive Business Resource Network when he led Hacienda CDC's Portland Mercado and Empresarios program. Um, and in previous roles at nonprofits and private companies in both the states and abroad, he's led teams and initiatives charged with business and partnership development, branding, sales, and marketing. Shay grew up in both Columbia and the states and received his BA in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of California at Berkeley, where he focused on international development and food justice. We are absolutely delighted to have Shay in this role um, and do want to note that his transition creates a new opportunity for a entrepreneurship and community economic development manager. That position is currently posted, so please uh, help us spread the word and help me welcome Shay to this new role. Thank you. Welcome, Shay, to your new role, and congratulations. We're very happy for you and uh, really excited about this development, so it's terrific. Look forward to talking to you more in person and off of Zoom about all this. <laughs> so congratulations. Congrats, Shay. Great. Thank you all. Great opportunity. It's an honor to carry forward the legacy of my predecessor, Tori Campbell, and just support our excellent economic development team. It's really excited to dive in, thank you. Great, terrific. Well, we're, we're delighted, delighted that you've taken this on. So, great. So, okay. So um, thank you, uh, Director Branham for that. And um, next up, we'll have the meeting minutes. Uh, so would someone like to make a motion to approve the June 23rd, 2021 minutes? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the minutes pass. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have public comment for items not on the agenda. And I understand that we have uh, one person, Karanja Cruz, who uh, is planning to speak and make a, a presentation. Um, we allocate about three minutes to these presentations, so it's not a very long time. Uh, but we um, appreciate you being here, Mr. Cruz, and look forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Um, awesome. Are you uh, on? Great. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, got it. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the board. Hello, Kimberly. And um, I believe I see Burke Nelson as well. Um, I think I know him from uh, the mayor's office. Hello, Burke. 
Um, appreciate the time. Um, I just want to jump right in. I only have uh, three minutes. Um, I don't know if you can please share the slide, but I have a petition that is going around uh, in the community right now. Um, and the petition basically is a, an official ask for Prosper Portland to change the funding allocation policies to help close the racial wealth gap. Um, I also sent you a uh, the link to the petition, so I want you to definitely take some time to, to look at that. But um, I just want to jump in and kind of let uh, share to the community, share with you all who I am. Um, my name is again, Karanja Cruz. I'm a Portland, Northeast Portland native. Um, I was born and raised um, in Portland, Oregon. In, in the midst of gentrification, I was born and raised in, in the 90s. Um, currently where my business is located is currently in the North, Northeast Development Action Plan that you guys all have in place. And ironically, that is the place that I was actually born and raised in. Um, as I walk to my business, I see this particular street that is blocked off on 14th and Killingsworth. Um, I believe my aunt, I believe that street was blocked off because of the drug traffic that was going along 14th and the gang activity that was going along during that time. And I noticed that the city invested to block that street off so they can be able to pretty much catch the criminals. And it was more so an investment to more so criminalize um, my community. If you fast forward uh, to 2021, uh, we're still in this economic disparity. We're still in this economic disadvantage. And I wanna share with you all because I, I have a different testimony because I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, but my parents was also fell victim to the systematic oppression that happens and they fell victim to crack cocaine. And because of that, I was born in poverty. I was born, I was uh, raised around gang activity and all these different things, but I was able to have a different trajectory. And the reason why I had a different trajectory is because of my mother's strength. She was able to stop her addiction and she moved me to Tacoma, Washington, right in the ninth grade where I was attending Benson High School. This is in 1993, uh, two of my relatives was murdered uh, through the gang violence. My, my actual father had just committed, um, he, he died through a stroke because he, of his addiction of crack cocaine. And I hope you guys will allow me to a little bit more three, uh, three minutes because I hope you're looking at this from a human perspective and not looking at this from a time perspective. Um, <clears throat> so I will hope you that you will allow me to have a little bit more time because I'm actually um, very emotional right now when I'm speaking about my testimony. Um, so as I continue on with this testimony, I wanted to share that because of my mother's strength and because she moved me out of this particular environment, I was able to have a different trajectory in life. And because of that, I became a teacher. Um, I also taught in my community. I taught at Vernon Elementary School. I taught at Jefferson High School with the intention to bring about empowerment with my community. As I continue to become a teacher, I noticed that the system of education continues to oppress my people in a sense of not giving us proper information to know how to function in this capitalism society and not giving us the economic literacy and the economic um, information, even capital to be able to compete in the society. So fast forward now as I'm a fifth grade teacher and now I'm also an entrepreneur and I'm still struggling with this whole idea of capitalism because capitalism is the root of racism. So in the midst of the George Floyd and the protests and everything that was happening in 2020, a lot of people did not know that it was a lot of shootings, a lot of the gang violence had increased. So how did the gang violence from the 90s when it started and how did it get worse in 2020? If you look at the economic opportunities for African-Americans, you will see why. So this ask is, is, is a different type of ask. So as I look at your North and Northeast development plan, and I look at the different language that you guys all have, 
and I look at the the um the language, I'm going to go ahead and read something that is pretty much in your plan, and it's under the item of building a cultural hub. So if you can move on to the next slide, uh, that's the third slide. The third slide, actually, uh, excuse me, the second slide, I'm sorry. If you notice that it says that we are trying to close the racial economic gap. How can you do that with loan allocations? So if you look at the columns, it says loan allocations. Well, if you have a loan, you're just only further in debt. So if we're trying to really bring about change for African-Americans, and notice I'm saying African-Americans and I'm saying Black and I'm not saying BIPOC because you have to be specific because when you talk the language of BIPOC, it brings other peoples who do not have this type of trajectory of slavery to all the different type of Jim Crow and all the different systematic racism that Black people have experienced and what Black people is going through today is there's no comparison. So that's the reason why I'm being very specific when I'm saying black. So now if my official ask is, as I look and, I'm, and, I, and as I'm competing in this cannabis industry, which is very hard, as I, as I say, because we did not start with capital. I, I started with my teacher retirement fund. So that's a whole different when there's, where this industry has been taken over by big corporations with big money. So I'm competing with that. So now as I'm walking, so basically and this is jump to the, to the last slide. So we have an opportunity. There's a, there's a building that is in our zone of having a licensed dispensary. There's an opportunity to purchase this commercial property that is about 10,000 feet that has a commercial building and it also has commercial space. However, we need Prosper Portland to provide us a loan that may be outside of TIP funds to acquire this overvalued commercial property. The reason why I say it's overvalued is because the property owner is selling it more than it's actually worth. And the reason why he's selling it more than it's actually worth is because it is, he has a pending permit to develop it on both sides of the lot. So we're asking to go outside of the TIF funds to acquire funding to be able to acquire this, this building through a loan with following providing three to four million dollars in grants and TIF funds to develop the property so then we can have value so then we can bring about more black businesses that can operate in that space or provide some type of promissory note to show outside lenders that there's a three to four million dollar grant funds that can be allocated to develop this cultural business hub. So that is my official ask. I wanted to connect it all because I believe it's full circle. As I'm, I'm walking down this gentrified neighborhood, which I live in and I have a business in, and I'm looking at these, at these opportunities, but then I look at your plan and, and it doesn't connect. So that is my fiscal ask. I appreciate the extra time and um, looking at this from a human perspective and not locking me in a time because I definitely am in an emotional state right now. So thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, I think, uh, so we, we really aren't in a position to, um, to make a decision um, and it's the kind of thing that staff would work with you on, uh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, my understanding is that there has been already been some discussions about a pre-development grant and a loan that would be extended to help acquire the property. So that's the direction that we're going at the moment. You know, we're, as you probably know, we're very limited in terms of our uh, non-TIF funding right now. Um, and so, you know, we probably don't have the resources to, to do this in the way that you have proposed. But, um, but the staff is um, looking to, forward to working with you on some type of, um, of program, which again would probably include a pre-development grant and a loan to help acquire the property. And uh, I think on behalf of the commissioners, we'd like to stay up to date with that. And um, if you'd like me to sit in on a future meeting or discussion, I'd be happy to do so. 
Thank thanks you. again. Th thanks again for uh, joining us today. We do appreciate it. And if we could get a link to the petition or just to get a little more information on, on the effort that's going into this. Thanks. Commissioners, I, I emailed the, both the slides and the link to the petition from Mr. Cruz earlier this afternoon, so you should have that in your inboxes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pam, were there any um, were there any other public comments to be made? None others received. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Next up on our agenda is the consent agenda, and. Um, we have four resolutions, number 7426, 7427, 7428, and 7429, all to consider. Um, unless anyone wants to discuss any particular one, I would accept a motion, or more than one, I would accept a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda in its entirety. So moved. Great, thank you. <laughs> Richard Myers, did I hear a second? second? Yeah. Great, thank you. And then uh, do we have Commissioner Platt on the line yes. yet? Yep. yep. We do? Peter, yes, great. All right, so uh, all those in favor then? Aye. Aye. Great, thank you. They all pass unanimously, thank you. Okay, uh, next up. We have an action item. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we do have we have a, a special action item. I should say. I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, this is election of officers. Um, the next item of the agenda is an election of officers. The annual process that is required by Prosper Portland and its bylaws. We will need to vote for a slate of officers, including the chair, vice chair, and treasurer. And would anybody like to make a vote motion to that effect? Yes, I would like to uh, make a motion to nominate Tavo Cruz to remain as chair, uh, Willie Myers as vice chair, and Peter Platt as treasurer. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We have a a new slate, a new old slate of officers. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, we have item 11. This is authorizing terms for lease agreements with the Nick Fish and authorizing additional funding for build out of commercial space there. And uh, Joanne, Christine Velasquez and Joanna Fulgaris is going, are going to speak on this. Are you both with us? Yes, I, uh, Christine Velasquez is on. I just need assistance in, um, in Great. starting my video. Thank you. Great. I am here as well. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. And uh, we're going to ask uh, if we can have our presentation um, pulled up. And uh, I will start. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. Um, again, my name is Christine Velasquez and I'm part of Prosper Portland's development and investment team where I oversee our affordable commercial tenanting efforts, serving as a thought partner and team member on all of our affordable commercial tenanting or ACT pilot projects, as well as serve as the project manager for our 10 y pilot project located at the 10th and Yamhill garage in downtown. As we bring today's item to the board on our proposed lease terms for the Nick Fish ACT pilot project, we wanted to take this opportunity to provide an update on our ACT efforts, including the latest on our current ACT pilot projects, our lessons learned working through these projects, opportunities for improvement and collaboration, and next steps as we work toward formalizing the ACT program. Uh, next slide. Prosper Portland recognized 
the need to provide equitable wealth generating opportunities to underserved and underrepresented communities by offering ACT tenant spaces and investing in ACT pilot projects to initially address a dramatic increase in retail rents and a decrease in vac vacancy re rates in the city of Portland. Although today's market is quite different from when we first launched our first two ACT projects due to the uh, impacts of the COVID pandemic and other market challenges, the value proposition that these opportunities provide remain the same. Uh, next slide. And these include focusing on creating access to retail spaces in Portland, reducing barriers to entry within the areas of leasing, upfront capital, permitting, and construction, providing technical assistance for small business capacity building, and developing attractive, affordable space to support small businesses. Uh, currently, Prosper Portland has five active ACT pilot projects with Alberta Commons being one of the first ACT pilot projects. Next slide. So Alberta Commons is, um, you may all know, uh, is a neighborhood retail center uh, with 20,000 square feet of commercial space, including 5,100 uh, square feet of ACT space. Uh, this is a public-private partnership through a master lease that Prosser Portland has with Majestic Realty. And the three ACT tenants uh, that we are happy to have there include Greenhaw's Gallery and Boutique owned by Cole and Dana Reed and Kaysen's Fine Meats uh, owned by Theotis or Uncle Theo uh, Kaysen who has been serving the community for well over 40 years and BIPOC owned um, barbershop um, champions. Next slide. Uh, we also uh, have the Oliver Station. This is um, 145 affordable and market rate housing units with 30,000 square feet of commercial space, including 4,000 feet of ACT space. Uh, this is a public-private partnership with Palindrome to provide ACT grants to priority tenants. Uh, we have uh, Bella Italian Bakery uh, offering great Italian baked goods and other food items. And um, this is in the Lens Town Center. Next slide. Uh, we also have 10Y. Um, this is a project uh, at the uh, 10th and Yam Hill Garage, a commercial space renovation and tenant lease leasing um, um, partnership through a master lease with PBOT. Um, we have uh, 21. 1,000 square feet of ACT space total, uh, which can be divvy up, divvied up into uh, small spaces. Um, currently, we have uh, a great lineup of ACT tenants with more to uh, come in the very near future, including uh, the Crick PDX owned by Bertoni Faustin. Uh, he is Oregon's first black winemaker, um, and we're happy to have him in downtown with a uh, wine tasting room. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Portland-based Orox Leather Company, uh, which was a long-standing uh, business here in Portland, and Amity Armisen, uh, Artisan Goods, owned by Al Sharif Eskander, and you have uh, probably seen his great products uh, with images of the bridges and other uh, Portland uh, landmarks on um, household goods and uh, clothing. Next slide. So through our work um, uh, managing and administering our ACT pilot programs, um, we have captured a number of lessons learned. Uh, these include defining and refining our structure um, around our internal ACT process um, with our development and investment team leading the project development side of our ACT process our econo uh, economic development team assisting with tenant sourcing and asset and our asset and investment team leading the leasing process as well as operations and management of our ACT pilot projects. Um, also um, understanding and learning how to better address business needs, um, including more engaging relationship building with our tenants, uh, providing guidance on the leasing process and providing access to capital. Uh, we've also learned um, 
uh, and have a better understanding of the level of space delivery and tenant uh, improvement allowance, um, including a warm shell delivery or move-in ready space um, at, um, our, um, at our ACT projects. Um, and uh, also looking at our tenant improvement allowance, which is also referred to as a grant for additional customization and design of a space. Um, we also learned um, more about um, uh, how to engage um, our tenants and or be more engaging with our tenants and um, really walking them through the leasing process. Um, and uh, we are uh, moving toward and um, have actively tapped into unique networks outside our traditional private industry, including uh, Mercados, My People's Market. Um, Kimberly alluded to uh, the next My People's Market taking place August 6th through the 8th. Um, uh, our um, IBRN network and the various ethnic chambers of commerce and um, considering more flexible lease terms and also lessons learned around management and operations, providing flexibility on terms to retain tenants and being timely and responsive to tenant operational needs. Next slide. We've also identified opportunities for improvement, um, including evaluating our risk tolerance levels and assessing financial performance as we work through the financial qualification process of tenants. Um, We've um, also, we also acknowledge um, uh, to continue to build out the tenant pipeline um, through external um, networks and partners, as I previously mentioned, um, providing technical assistance from the onset of the, the tenant improvement process from site selection through permitting and construction to grant opening and considering more pop-ups and interim programming to temporarily activate spaces and encourage foot traffic. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of a successful pop-up that uh, is currently uh, on display at 10Y. Uh, this is the My People's Market window shop um, in which local businesses and artisans display their products. Um, and with the convenience of an online uh, um, QRL code, shoppers can purchase products and support these small businesses. Uh, and that's going to be running through uh, July 25th. Next slide. And thank you. Um, we also put the, uh, the link to the My People's Market window shop in the chat. In terms of next steps, um, they include developing the ACT program guidelines and presenting a formal ACT program to the board at a future date. Collaborate with private sector, with the private sector to scale small businesses and to promote uh, programs such as the affordable commercial mixed use space bonus program to share the, um, the responsibility to provide equitable commercial space opportunities uh, to small businesses um, by um, paying in lieu fees or including affordable commercial spaces in new developments. Um, in turn, developers can receive a uh, bonus FAR or floor area ratio or height bonus um, to encourage um, uh, more uh, spaces and opportunities for, afford uh, for tenants as well as um, generate funds to continue to administer and grow the affordable commercial tenanting program. Um, that concludes my portion of the presentation and I will uh, turn it over to Joanna. Thank you, Christine. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners. It is good to see you all. Uh, my name is Joanna Fugates. I am the current project manager for the Nick Fish, formerly known as Halsey 106. Uh, next slide, please. So you're here today asking the board to approve uh, general lease terms for the spaces we own at the Nick Fish. We are asking for approval to lease the spaces between $15 and $20 per square foot. And we expect to have uh, leases between three and 10 years with options to renew and uh, small um, escalations on the, the rent. Next slide. 
So the project was completed just in April this year. It is a partnership with PHB and Human Solutions. We own approximately 11,000 square feet of retail space that can be subdivided into nine spaces. There are 52 affordable and 23 market rate apartments above us and Human Solution also owns the, the office space on the second floor. Next slide. So this project aligns really well with our strategic plan goals of creating vibrant neighborhoods and shared prosperity. Next slide, please. So in terms of neighborhoods, um, the Gateway Action Plan was created in 2016 and it called for activation of the Widler Halsey Business Corridor, which this project um, supports by creating nine retail spaces. This also prioritizes um, businesses that create food traffic and um, create cross-pollination uh, for other businesses. And those are some of the, the characteristics that an advisory committee along with Prosper staff um, came up with for, for the spaces. Next slide. And in terms of prosperity creation, so as we said, it prioritizes BIPOC, women in locally owned businesses, um, also part of the, the list of characteristics uh, from the advisory committee. We are offering ACT grants uh, for tenants that qualify. Um, the rent is below market rate. Currently, the market rate in that area is between 18 and $33 a square foot. Um, and the lease rates in the past were, no, I'm sorry, the current available rates are between 12 and 33 and the lease rates in the past were between 18 and 33. Um, as Christine explained on the ACT information, we, our spaces are also deliv delivered in warm shell conditions which helps um, tenants visualize and it also reduces the cost and the timing for the spaces to be ready. Next slide. Um, so Prosper recognizes the historical disadvantages and lack of opportunity to BIPOC communities. And it is our goal along with the community priorities um, to prioritize BIPOC owned businesses uh, as Christine also highlighted, the ACT program does uh, prioritize BIPOC and local tenants and um, supports the, the, um, our work with BIPOC communities and in creating prosperity. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, the Retail Advisory Committee, uh, that was a group of um, community members that came together with Prosper staff uh, in 2018, I believe, um, to determine what were the business priorities and characteristics for the space. And Prosper is committed to continue working with them in reviewing future tenants. Um, some of the characteristics to be prioritized are BIPOC, locally owned businesses and women owned businesses. Um, they want to make sure that businesses are open to the public and are creating food traffic and creating additional business to, to neighboring businesses as well, uh, among a few others uh, priorities. Next slide. So here are some of those priorities as I was mentioning. So they want to, businesses that are open to the public between 10 and seven at least, uh, create food traffic and cross pollination uh, they want to prioritize retail and retail, I'm sorry, restaurant and retail space, locally owned, BIPOC and women owned businesses. Um, they also want to make sure that businesses open there have experience and they want to stay away from office or businesses that um, require appointment um, and are not open just for food traffic as well as businesses that do not allow for children to, to enter um, and have more restrictions. Oh, and also nothing that really closes the window uh, so people can see inside of the store and it can create more of a, a community experience. Um, next slide. And you can go to the next one, Justin. Thank you. So we are also asking to increase um, the budget. Initially, the cost approved by the board for 
Clean Lord and TI was 3.5. We are asking to be increased to 3,650,000 um, to support the warm shell cost. And um, because we're also expecting more spaces to receive ACT grants. We currently do have businesses that are interested. Fingers crossed, we'll be getting LOI soon. And so far, most of the businesses that reached out to us would qualify for an ACT grant. So we want to make sure we have enough funds to support all the businesses that want to go there. Uh, next slide. So this is it for my presentation. And I want to see if anyone has any questions. Great. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Uh, that's really a great presentation and um, exciting to have you know, the space coming online. So at the Nick Fish, we have we have some interest from a few businesses, um, and are we we're handling it via? How, we're not listing this with a broker, right? Or what? How are we, we doing? How are we doing that? We are. We currently have a broker um, okay. that has been showing and communicating with um, potential tenants. We are already kind of marketing through our network. Um, because we do have access to so many of the businesses that would be priority, right? Uh, so we are sending through, we have, we're gonna be sending through our uh, newsletter, but we have been telling people within our network that is available. Great. So we have, we have nine spaces there, and then we still have some spaces left at 10Y, right? Um, right. And, and then this, Lens and Commons. This, and, okay, so I'm just curious, how many, how many affordable, commercial spaces do we have now that are accessible for businesses that want to get started right now? Well, so like the Nick Fish has nine, uh, Lens Commons has a total of four. One is under construction for the yoga studio and it should, fingers crossed, it will be ready by September, mid-September or so. Uh, and I'll let Christine talk about 10Y. Sure. Um, there's uh, roughly 12 spaces at 10Y, um, and um, uh, we can get a little creative with some of the spaces at our affordable commercial um, pilot projects in which we can carve up spaces um, um, to help accommodate small businesses who may need a smaller footprint for businesses. Uh, so, uh, yes, and we have, um, we are we're actively working through the letter of intent process for um, additional tenants at 10Y, and hopefully we'll be able to announce um, yet another new lease at 10Y. And I, I did want to note that the three tenants that came into 10Y opened during the pandemic. Um, they really um, believe in the downtown and, um, um, of course, believe in Portland and, and the market and uh, want to line up with each other creating um, kind of a hub of businesses that are BIPOC owned. Great, thank, thank you. So it sounds like we have like maybe around 25 affordable spaces available, which is kind of a nice, it's a good, good inventory. That's great. And hopefully we'll get them all rented so we can say <laughs> we did our job and there's none available. <laughs> we'll Excellent. have a list, a waiting list. <laughs> Excellent, that's what we want. <laughs> Do you have any other any other questions comments? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was great. So, um, would someone like to make a motion to approve resolution number seven four three zero, authorizing terms for lease agreements at the Nick Nick Fish and authorizing additional funding for build out of the commercial space? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Okay. So next up, we have um, an information item. This is an update on Portland Means Progress, uh, the 20, 2019 and 2020 impact report. And Andrea Gall will make that presentation. And there you are. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much, Justin. Do you mind pulling up the slides? Thank you so much. All right, good afternoon, Chair Cruz, Commissioners, and Executive Director Branham. My name is Andrea Gall, and I serve as the Senior Project Manager on the Business and Industry Team in the Economic Development Department. 
The business and industry team has a key goal of helping traded sector companies become more inclusive. And Portland Means Progress is one initiative within the business and industry team programming, along with TechTown and Inspiring Diversity grant that supports this goal. I'm here today to share the 2019-2020 Portland Means Progress Impact Report. So as Chair Cruz said, it's an information item. Um, and this report was developed from two years of annual reporting data from Portland Means Progress businesses, as well as reflection on our own interventions as an initiative. Over two years, we've developed new programming, grown the initiative to over 100 businesses, and work to build an initiative that makes meaningful connections for businesses in Portland to engage in racial equity work. And of course, anytime we present anything like this, it's never just the person presenting who's behind the work. So I'd like to just thank uh, the core team, uh, Court Morse and Yvonne Smoker, the team who helped develop our accountability surveys, Faith Aiken, Robert Smith, Andy Reed, Ann Mangan and Lisa Norwood from our communications team, the business and industry team who partner in the work and all the folks who help us get, get the work done. I would also be remiss if I didn't thank our partners in the initiative who've helped and inform and in shape Portland Means Progress and are deeply engaged in building a meaningful program for the businesses. This has already been one of our key learnings in the work that having this core group of partners that represent multicultural chambers and large business organizations has helped shift and inform the work as key th thought partners, as opposed to us doing this alone. Next slide. So here today I'm showing the true full impact report for the sake of time, I won't cover everything in the report, and I look forward to just sharing some high-level findings. So if it feels like I'm skipping over items, it's because I 100% am doing that. Uh, I hope that you'll have the time to review the entire report because I think there's a lot of learnings, but I'll do my best to strike a balance between being transparent and authentic, but not speaking at you for an hour, which I could definitely do because I think this is all really fascinating. So next slide. And this is an example of one we'll skip because we'll go into this as we go into it. So next slide. All right, so what is Portland Means Progress? So y'all are familiar with this, but I'll share it again that Portland Means Progress is a citywide initiative to connect businesses to programming to advance racial equity in Portland. Businesses commit to paying at least $15 an hour across their organization and commit to at least one of the following actions. So one is to host work experience opportunities for underrepresented youth and young professionals of color. One is to make intentional purchasing decisions by purchasing locally from businesses owned by people of color. And the last is to create culture change internally through diversity, equity, and inclusion work. This initiative was informed by the Mayor's Council of Economic Advisors, and their key goal was to create an actionable mechanism for the private sector to advance racial equity in Portland. Portland Means Progress launched in March of 2019 with 50 early adopter businesses. Next slide. In 2020, 99 businesses competed, completed our annual reporting and they represent over 50,000 employees in Portland. Here are some of the demographics represented in Portland Means Progress. These businesses range in size from one employee up to 15,000 and are across industries. And the core audience of this is for-profit businesses and it also includes nonprofit and across industries. So that kind of represents some of our challenges in building a meaningful initiative across that wide array of businesses. Next slide. And this shows some of the commitments that businesses made. So again, businesses can commit to one, two, or all three of the actions, and they can also go beyond what they originally committed to throughout the year. Next slide. So in terms of structure for our impact report, we look to present the data in alignment with results-based accountability guidance. So for each action area, work experience, intentional purchasing, and culture change, we share what did we do, how well did we do, and what was the impact, and then we also share our learnings from our findings and how we're gonna adjust in the, in the coming year. Because again, that's one of our goals in being accountable is learning from what we're seeing and then adjusting based on that. Next slide. So first work experience. In terms of what did we do, we saw that over two years of the initiative, so 2019 and 2020, 340 interns were hosted. This was largely through our partners at Emerging Leaders and Work Systems, as well as through internal internship programs at companies. Interestingly, we found a high cumulative number was really driven by a small number of large companies, but most of the companies who committed to work experience hosted one to two interns. Next slide. So now you're getting a vibe for how I'm skipping over lots of the content so we can kind of get through it. Uh, in terms of how well did we do, we asked questions around implementation of known best practices for hosting meaningful work experiences. So we tried to look beyond strictly the number of internships that took place but the quality of those internships. We found that most companies had formal onboarding processes 
and very few offered mentorship programs for employees of color. Particularly the smaller businesses had a hard time implementing this. Next slide. And in asking about our impact across work experience, the questions we asked centered around experience for interns as well as for companies. Largely the feedback was positive, but there were challenges specifically in 2020 responses about remote engagement, both from the intern side as well as from the company side. Next slide. And so in looking at what's next, of note for work experience as we look in, into our programming for 2021, we're looking specifically at the requested resources and support from businesses. So we're, we're listening to what businesses specifically said that they were having trouble accessing. And specifically, we're gonna hone in on programming that offers mentorship to employees of color because we found that in 2019 and 2020, that was the least implemented action. And we've seen that that has a meaningful impact to uh, employees of color at companies having a positive work experience. Next slide. So now we're on to intentional purchasing. Next slide. In terms of what did we do, in total, over two years of the initiative, Portland Means Progress businesses spent nearly $150 million at businesses owned by people of color. Also with intentional purchasing, like with work experience, we found that a few large businesses drove this higher number. Uh, interestingly, as you look at the percentage of spend, a lot of the small businesses were able to move in terms of their percentage of spend, which I think is really interesting. So larger businesses could drive a high cumulative amount and this, a, a number of small businesses were able to create some really strong movement in terms of their percentage of their spend. Next slide. In terms of how well did we do, we saw increased implementation of equitable purchasing and procurement practices. And we saw that the businesses who implemented higher levels of practices and policies that lead to intentional purchasing had higher percent amounts of spend. Um, we found that businesses that implemented at least three intentional spending policies were more likely to spend a higher percentage of total expenditures at businesses owned by people of color. So we're kind of seeing that direct correlation between that behavior shift and that dollar amount that comes out. Next slide. In terms of what was the impact, Comparing our 2019 and our 2020 data, we saw promising shifts in terms of purchasing changes from early adopters from the first to second year of the initiative. So you remember we had 50 early adopters in the first year, 2019, and then we had more businesses join us in 2020. So looking for movement from 2019 to 2020, early adopters increased their spend from year on year. Next slide. In terms of what ne what's next, we identified the need for support in terms of B2B connections, specifically and especially for small businesses. We saw for larger businesses, the need for support in terms of peer learning and shifting procurement practices. And last, we saw a need for technical assistance in terms of tracking spend. So we saw that a, there was an improved amount of businesses that tracked from 2019 to 2020 in terms of being able to understand their dollars out the door but a lot of businesses didn't have the capability to do so. So we're working on technical assistance for them to be able to report those numbers. Next slide. And for culture change, next slide. In terms of what did we do for culture change, 2020 was a really important year because in 2019, the Portland Means Progress team spent the year building out the framework for culture change action. In March of 2020, we rolled out the culture change roadmap which has since been viewed more than 14,000 times by people in 90 countries. Next slide. In terms of how well did we do, we asked businesses about behavior shift shifts within their organizations. We found that businesses with more than 100 employees are more likely to implement culture change actions and small businesses struggled with the capacity to implement this work. We also saw that businesses that identified as minority owned reported more diverse employee and leadership representation. Next slide. And in terms of what was the impact, we saw a correlation between businesses who made connections with other Portland Means Progress businesses as having a higher implementation of DEI actions. So businesses who said that they did connect with other Portland Means Progress businesses throughout the year were more likely to say that they had implemented different DEI actions and behavior shifts. We also saw that early adopters were more likely to have made these connections. The reason for this, we think, is that early adopters signed on in 2019 when we were able to offer lots of in-person engagement opportunities. And in 2020, the new businesses that joined us 
have only been able to engage in our remote programming so far. Next slide. So having learned that in terms of what's next, our goals for Culture Change Center around personal connections, especially because at least for the very near term, we're still looking largely at, at remote engagement. So first, we're looking at implementing more direct engagement with our new equity inclusion program manager, Court Morse, so one-on-one -on -one connections with businesses to support them. We're also hosting a community conversa conversation series with the goal of creating affinity spaces between the businesses, as well as working on interventions to make connections between racial equity practitioners in the city with businesses. So really looking at the connection focus. Next slide. And as we look forward, next slide. Of the 99 businesses that completed our annual reporting in 2020, 90 of them recommitted to Portland Means Progress. Those that didn't largely cited internal challenges to engaging, but one business did share that they were hoping for more meaningful contact. So again, that's something we're really thinking about as we look towards, at least again, this near term having mostly remote engagement, what it looks like to support businesses in that way. Next slide. And as we continue to build our 2021 programming, we're seeking to respond to the top requests from businesses of where they think they need support, as well as engaging with the more than 20 new businesses who have committed to Portland Means Progress since this impact report was published. So we're excited to that we're maintaining momentum, especially given the challenges that pandemics have brought to the Portland business community. And we're finding that Portland businesses are really hungry for technical assistance and ways to engage in their racial equity commitments. As we move forward, we're really thinking how do we maintain a depth of engagement for businesses so that it continues to be meaningful in a way that we can scale as, as hopefully more businesses continue to join us in this work. Next slide. And this is our last page. And again, I would just be remiss if I didn't say again that we're deeply thankful to our project partners who lo whose logos are shown here. They've been critical, supportive thought partners and instrumental in, in the founding and growth. And thanks to the larger team, that's it. Great, thank you. That was a great update and uh, really good information and uh, good to know how things are going. So um, quick question. So how do you think the pandemic affected our numbers for last year? I mean, it seemed to me that overall we did pretty well given the circumstances, but um, you could see like, for example, the, those mentorship numbers are a little lower than we had hoped for. That seems to me like it would be directly affected by the pandemic. It's really hard to mentor people when all you have is Zoom, you know, or uh, or phone calls. So I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. I would say I, I agree with you completely. I think that the the landscape in 2020 really shifted what we even offered as an initiative as well. So I think that as we were early in 2020, you know, March, we had our culture change roadmap rollout. It was very well attended. We had really strong momentum. Then the pandemic hit and it really felt a little bit of an uh-oh moment. Things really slowed. Everyone kind of moved into crisis mode. We shift our programming about how people can retain and center their values during a pandemic because that was one of our top concerns is sometimes when people go to crisis mode, you immediately revert back to old ways of being, which is kind of the opposite of, of the entire goal of a lot of the culture change work. Um, then coming through the summer and with the racial justice movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, the top request we got from businesses was actually centered around accountability. So that was kind of an interesting shift. So the technical assistance that we most received requests for was about how businesses could speak about the work that they're doing in a way that's authentic and real and doesn't feel like a pat on the back, but feels like a vocal movement towards change um, that's backed by actual commitment, right? So not just saying we care about it, but saying it with some meat. And so that was um, at the end of 2020, we offered an accountability and racial equity series and mm -hmm. that was really well received. But I totally agree with you. I think people really had to shift. We saw a few businesses shift what their commitments were. They started saying they would host a work experience. Their style of work just doesn't allow for remote internships. So they shifted more to intentional purchasing. So we definitely saw people trying to, again, center their values and hold true, but really having to shift how they show up because it maybe their original plans just weren't feasible anymore. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions? We have two, two guest speakers on this topic too. I, I just wanted to say real quick that, um, you know, SOJ um, became a member oh, over, a, over a year ago, and I just have found it to be immensely valuable. I think 
we, like a lot of other businesses, we're trying to find ways to really double down on our efforts and, and, and to do more in, in equity, in our equity building efforts. And um, I just think the framework and the resources that are available, the, the racial equity workshops that you guys have been holding have been fantastic. And the, um, just the, you know, the business to business um, exchanges are, are, are immensely valuable. And I'm, I'm just kind of, it's again, having gone through, through the pandemic, I, I get the numbers being kind of lower than you would expect. It just, it seems like such a no brainer for me to be for like every business to be enrolled in this. So I feel like um, with a few folks I've talked to, you know, don't know about it. I just, um, I think we should just strategize on ways that, you know, even just the board and other folks can help get the word out. Um, Cause I just, again, just some, um, you know, other firms that we work with hadn't, hadn't heard about it. And I, I just think everyone should be in enrolling in it. And it's, it's the, it's, it's a great, great resource. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would just throw in is about the mentorship. Um, it's just worth mentioning because I know we're doing mentorship, but we chose to do it through another program that's not recognized pro Portland East Progress. Um, so we're doing it through a nonprofit school that serves mostly BIPOC youth and, um, but it's not part of the program. So I think we're, you know, I, and I imagine you have quite a few of those probably businesses that are doing the mentorship just through a different channel. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mike Gambetti. And since you enjoyed the program, I would love if Yvonne and Court were willing to just come off muted video and wave because they built it. And so I would love if they can just say hi. And they've been amazing. <laughs> Great. Seriously, Thanks, you, guys you guys have done a phenomenal job, both of you. Thank you so much for your kind words. It's really Great. nice to hear direct feedback. Thank you. Well, we have um, two, two guest speakers on this too, Serafi Allen from the mayor's office and Adrian Challey from Central East Side Industrial Council are both with us, I think, uh, to speak. I hope. Great. Excellent. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, it's Welcome. my first time, let's see, in the office now with the different screens, so I'm getting used to <laughs> where it's at. Um, so, hi, uh, thank you, Chair Cruz and Commissioners, for your time today. Uh, while I know many of you, my name is Serafi Allen, and I serve as the uh, Director of Jobs, Housing, and Economic Equity for Mayor Wheeler. Uh, I just wanted to quickly share the Mayor's gratitude to Prosper Portland and the Board for your support of Portland Means Progress. Um, as Andrea mentioned earlier, uh, Portland Means Progress came out of the Mayor's Council for Economic Advisors, which many of you were on um, that way back in 2017. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know, because we wanted to have an avenue for businesses to actively engage in our equity goals and take action. And so um, the statistics from today's report are really exciting, even though you know, dampered by COVID as most things have been, um, but just wanted to express the mayor's office is looking forward to um, continuing to support this effort and seeing how we can improve and expand our impact. Um, so that's it. Thanks everyone and nice to see folks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Adrienne Chalet with Central East Side Industrial Council. I'm the program manager for our transportation programs and Central East Side together. Um, and the team asked me to speak a little bit about our experience with the initiative. And so I've prepared some notes. I hope it's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my talking points um, to share with everyone. It's just how my brain works. <laughs> At, um, at the Central East Side Industrial Council, we were at the beginning of launching organizational-wide racial equity work when we joined Portland Means Progress, and the initiative and team have been essential in shaping our timeline, process, and engagement efforts. Since we began our work, we have formed a diversity, equity, and inclusion working group with leadership across our organization deeply engaged. This includes people from OMSI, Milagro Theater, uh, Urban Development Partners, and Autodesk utilized an equity lens in our annual budgeting process, developed a living document that serves as a framework with clear baseline indicators in formation. We're developing new board recruitment processes and HR policies, and the board has allocated funding towards a professional racial equity consultant to support 
creating a theory of change, equity commitment, and formalized framework for our first ever strategic planning process. The Portland Means Progress team and efforts didn't direct or drive this because there's no one size fits all, but rather supported us in constructing our approach, taking the time to listen to our unique challenges and provide both high level feedback that reflects best practices, as well as pointing us towards or validating important fine grained details that are essential to supporting staff in this process. As a nonprofit organization and business association, the team has done an excellent job at meeting, adapting to meet our unique needs at Central East Side Industrial Council. One piece of feedback for, for everyone is just that we would recommend additional resources that are tailored to the nonprofit sector to include board recruitment and retention, for example. In addition to the CEIC work, I'm on the Venture Portland Equity Committee, which would benefit from these additional resources and also has received essential feedback from the team. Um, a few main takeaways, I just wanted to share that the team has provided thoughtful feedback and key check-in moments, both one-on-one -on -one and in community, continuously reminded us that this is ongoing complex work that takes time high quality meaningful opportunities for engagement with the larger community and communities of practice and concrete applicable resources that are constantly, they are constantly innovating and adapting to feedback, really showing us by doing. As a small nonprofit organization that has a very wide reach, we would definitely recommend and continue to recommend this participation in this initi initiative to others, um, encouraging us to always center race, and not take shortcuts and to go intentionally about the process by constantly checking in, most importantly focused on people first, really working hard to avoid being performative. So I wanna thank the team in particular, Court, Andrea, Yvonne and Andy and the Portland leadership, Prosper leadership for continuing to prioritize this important initiative and count on us to be partners and amplifying it further. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation and uh, thank you for your partnership in the program. It's great. Does anybody have any additional questions or comments? No, quiet. All right. Well, thanks. That was a great update. And um, I'm just really glad to see this initiative, you know, continuing to develop and build steam and, um, and, you know, all of the the impact that it's had is really cool. <laughs> I was really impressed with some of the numbers. Uh, so that, that's really great. So thanks for all of that. Um, well, if nobody has any further uh, comments or anything else they want to raise uh, for the good of the order, uh, this will be the end of our meeting today. And uh, there being no further items on the agenda, the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners meeting is now adjourned. So thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.